In Protestant Christianity, the relationship between law and gospel—God's law and the gospel of Jesus Christ—is a major topic in Lutheran and Reformed theology. In these religious traditions, the distinction between the doctrines of law, which demands obedience to God, S. Ethical will, and Gospel, which promises the forgiveness of sins in light of the person and work of Jesus Christ, is critical. Ministers use it as a hermeneutical principle of biblical interpretation and as a guiding principle in homiletics sermon composition and pastoral care. It involves the supersession of the Old Covenant including traditional Jewish law, or halakha by the New Covenant and Christian theology. Other Christian groups have a view on the issue as well, or more generally views of the Old Covenant, though the matter has not usually been as hotly debated or rigorously defined as in the Lutheran and Reformed traditions. Sometimes the issue is discussed under the headings of "...law and grace", "...sin and grace", "...spirit and letter", and "...ministry of death, condemnation", and "...ministry of the Spirit, righteousness". Topic: Lutheran view. Topic: Topic: Martin Luther and Lutheran theologians. Topic: A specific formulation of the distinction of law and gospel was first brought to the attention of the Christian Church by Martin Luther, 1483 to 1546, and laid down as the foundation of evangelical Lutheran biblical exegesis and exposition in Article 4 of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, 1531. All Scripture ought to be distributed into these two principal topics: the law and the promises. For in some places it presents the law, and in others the promise concerning Christ, namely, either when in the Old Testament it promises that Christ will come, and offers, for his sake, the remission of sins, justification, and life eternal, or when, in the Gospel in the New Testament, Christ himself, since he has appeared, promises the remission of sins, justification, and life eternal. The formula of Concord likewise affirmed this distinction in Article 5, where it states, "...we believe, teach, and confess that the distinction between the law and the gospel is to be maintained in the Church with great diligence." Martin Luther wrote, "...hence, whoever knows well this art of distinguishing between law and gospel, him place at the head and call him a doctor of Holy Scripture." Throughout the Lutheran Age of Orthodoxy 1580 this hermeneutical discipline was considered foundational and important by Lutheran theologians. This distinction was the first article in Patrick S. Places by Patrick Hamilton. Carl Ferdinand Wilhelm Walther (1811–1887), who was the first and third president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, renewed interest in and attention to this theological skill in his evening lectures at Concordia Seminary, St. Louis, 1884–85. Topic: <laughs> Book of Concord. Topic. The formula of Concord distinguished three uses, or purposes, in the law in Article 6. It states, T he law was given to men for three reasons. That, thereby outward discipline might be maintained against wild, disobedient men and that wild and intractable men might be restrained, as though by certain bars. That, men thereby may be led to the knowledge of their sins. That, after they are regenerate they might have a fixed rule according to which they are to regulate and direct their whole life." The primary concern was to maintain that the law should continue to be used by Christians after they had been regenerated by the Holy Spirit through the Gospel to counter the doctrine of Johannes Agricola, who taught that the law was no longer needed by regenerate Christians. Confessional Lutheranism teaches that the law cannot be used to deny the Gospel, neither can the Gospel be used to deny God's law. The three uses of the law are curb, through fear of punishment, the law keeps the sinful nature of both Christians and non Christians under check. This does not stop sin, since the sin is already committed when the heart desires to do what is wrong, yet it does stop the open outbreak of sin that will do even further damage. Mirror – The law serves as a perfect reflection of what God created the human heart and life to be. 
It shows anyone who compares his, her life to God's requirement for perfection that he, she is sinful. Guide, this use of the law that applies only to Christians. The law becomes the believer's helper. Empowered by the gospel truth of forgiveness and righteousness in Christ, the believer's new self eagerly desires to live to please the triune God. Reformed view the distinction between law and gospel is a standard formulation in Reformed theology, though in recent years some have characterized it as distinctively Lutheran. Zacharias Ursinus sharply distinguished the law and gospel as the chief and general divisions of the Holy Scriptures. In his commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism, Louis Burkhoff called the law and the gospel the two parts of the Word of God as a means of grace. Law and gospel are found in both testaments. In his Institutes of the Christian Religion, the reformer John Calvin distinguished three uses in the law. Calvin wrote the following, T. O. Make the whole matter clearer. Let us survey briefly the function and use of what is called the moral law. Now, so far as I understand it, it consists of three parts. W. Heil it shows God's righteousness, it warns, informs, convicts, and lastly condemns, every man of his own unrighteousness." 2.7.6. It functions, "...by fear of punishment to restrain certain men who are untouched by any care for what is just and right unless compelled by hearing the dire threats in the law." 2.7.10. It admonishes believers and urges them on in well-doing. 2.7.12–13, this scheme is the same as the formula of Concord, with the exception that the first and second uses are switched. In later Reformed scholasticism the order is the same as for Lutherans. The three uses are called The usus politicus sive civilis, the political or civil use, is a restraint on sin and stands apart from the work of salvation. It is part of God's general revelation or common grace for unbelievers as well as believers. The usus elenticus sive pedagogicus, the elenctical or pedagogical use which confronts sin and points us to Christ. The usus didacticus sive normativus, the didactic use, which is solely for believers, teaching the way of righteousness. The Heidelberg Catechism, in explaining the third use of the law, teaches that the moral law is contained in the Ten Commandments as binding for Christians and that it instructs Christians how to live in service to God in gratitude for His grace shown in redeeming mankind. John Calvin deemed this third use of the law as its primary use. <laughs> Lutheran and Reformed differences Scholastic Lutheran and Reformed theologians differed primarily on the way in which the third use of the law functions for believers. The Reformed emphasized the third use because the redeemed are expected to bear good works. Some Lutherans saw here the danger of works righteousness, and argued that the third use should always return believers to the second use and again to Christ rather than being the ultimate norm. Additionally, some have suggested that the third use of the law is not found at all in Luther but comes from Philip Melanchthon. Although some Lutherans have rejected that view, it has caused others to dispute the validity of the third use of the law entirely. Paul Althaus, for instance, writes in his treatise on law and gospel. This ethical guidance by the Holy Spirit implies that God's concrete commanding cannot be read off from a written document, an inherited scheme of law. I must learn afresh every day what God wants of me. For God's commanding has a special character for each individual, it is always contemporary, always new. God commands me and each person in a particular way, in a different way than He commands others. The living and spiritual character of the knowledge of what God requires of men in the present moment must not be destroyed by rules and regulations." Such theologians believe the third use leads to or encourages a form of legalism and is possibly an implicit denial of sola fide. Conversely, Reformed Christians have sometimes seen this two-use scheme of some modern Lutherans as leading to a form of antinomianism. Some believe that. For Luther the pedagogic use of the law was primary, while for Calvin this third or didactic use was the principal one, yet historically both the Lutheran and the Reformed traditions maintain the threefold conceptualization. Imperative and indicative 
Topic Certain recurring grammatical patterns in the Old Testament and in the New involving the sequencing of imperative and indicative predicates are taken by theologians as central to the relationship between law and gospel. Daniel Defoe discusses three pairs of these predicates in his second and final sequel to Robinson Crusoe, Serious Reflections "'Forbear and live. Do and live. Believe and live.' According to Defoe, the first was established with Adam in paradise, the second is the law with the children of Israel, and the third is the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, Luther viewed all imperative commands as law, even the command to believe the gospel. In The Bondage of the Will, he writes, T he commands exist to show, not our moral ability, but our inability. This includes God's command of all men everywhere to repent and believe the gospel, an impossible act of will apart from a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit uniting us to Christ. p. 149 topic See also topic topic Notes topic topic Further reading topic Lutheran Althaus, Paul. The Divine Command, A New Perspective on Law and Gospel. Trans. Franklin Sherman. Philadelphia, Fortress Press, 1966. Benta, F. and Doe, W. H. T., E. D. S., and Trans. Triglot Concordia, The Symbolical Books of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. St. Louis, Concordia Publishing House, 1921. Bookoffconcord.org Ellert, Werner. Law and Gospel. Trans. Edward H. Schroeder. Philadelphia, Fortress Press, 1967. Walther. C. F. W. The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel. St. Louis, Mo. Concordia Publishing House, 1986, Reformed Bonson, Greg L. Theonomy in Christian Ethics. S. L., Covenant Media Press, 2002. Barth, Carl. Gospel and Law in Community, State and Church, Three Essays. Will Herberg, ed. New York, Doubleday Anchor Books, 1960. Calvin, John. The law given, not to retain a people for itself, but to keep alive the hope of salvation in Christ until his advent, Institutes of the Christian Religion, BK 2, Section 7. 2 Clark, R. Scott. Retaining the Law Gospel Distinction 3 Gundery, Stanley N., ed. 5 Views on Law and Gospel. Grand Rapids, Michigan, Zondervan, 1996. Horton, Michael S. Calvin on Law and Gospel, Westminster Seminary, California 4 Murray, John. Principles of Conduct, Aspects of Biblical Ethics. Grand Rapids, Michigan, Eerdmans, 1957. Topic external links Topic Law in Luther and Calvin, by Edward A. Dowie The Struggle to Balance Law and Grace, by Bernie L. Gillespie The Christian and the Moral Law, link list at the-highway.com Topic Lutheran Topic Hummel, Horace D. Our Law and Gospel A Valid Hermeneutical Principle? Online Concordia Theological Quarterly 46 1982, Number 2-3-181-207 Available from ctsfw.edu Klug, Eugene F. Confessional Emphasis on Law and Gospel for Our Day online Concordia Theological Quarterly 42 No. 3-241-257. Available from ctsfw.edu Luker, Erwin L. Law and Gospel from the Christian Cyclopedia. Concordia Publishing House, 2000. Rosenthal, Shane Law and Gospel. Using the Third Use, Formula of Concord v. and the Preacher's Task Walther, C.F.W. Law and Gospel, Excerpts. Walther, C.F.W. The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel, Complete Work. Buckholtz, John D. Justification, Handling the Word of Truth, Part 3 of 5, Forward in Christ, April 2006. Wells Publication, accessed April 17, 2006. Scholarly articles on law and gospel from the Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary Library Topic Reformed Calvinist Topic Law and Grace, Sermon by C. H. Spurgeon God's Law in Man's Heart, Sermon by C. H. Spurgeon Law and Grace by John Murray Calvin and the Law Gospel Hermeneutic by Michael Horton What's Really at Stake? by Michael Horton Calvin's Third Use of the Law, An Assessment of Reformed Explications of the Ten Commandments by John P. Burgess in PDF Michael Horton, John Calvin, and Law and Gospel, by Bill De Jong mixing law and gospel in the Abrahamic promise by Mark Horn Law and Liberty Law and Gospel extensive link list at monergism.com